7 Tango Tango, Johnson on here to ground. Hey, that stuff's hitting the road, we got a couple spots across already. Okay, we've got the Cedar City Hot Shots with the dozer trying to punch up that little line in, uh, going down from Pilot Point down into the creek. I want to expedite that thing to close in on uh, the safety zone. So you're going to have to kind of keep a close eye on that column coming up the southeast side there. And if we need to, we need to move people out of there. And, uh, it doesn't look like it's going to hit that road pretty hard. Uh, flanking off the off the hill, parallel in the road, but uh, you know that could all change. In the process of the, we've evacuated the Hawkins Hella base. We're in the process of moving all the personnel over to a new Hella base that's going to be established. Make sure we pick up anything behind uh, both crews that are burning. That's probably the priority. I would see in here right now. Diverted the two helicopters over here to start uh, cooling off the fire around Windy Point. You'll, you, I'm sure you can see that. If we're going to have a wildland fire use program. It can never be zero risk. If if we want to take the easy way out and always say no, it's we can do that. I mean, it's I mean probably uh, not resource wise, but but politically, it'll, it's it's usually easier to take the you know, let it be a, a suppression action. We're always heroes when we're in a, when we're a, when we're suppressing. We're less than heroes sometimes in 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 this phase. I guess my perspective is when I come down, I, it's not just to look over folks' shoulders and, and uh, try to play gotcha at all. I, tr I try to come in and say, what, you know, what support can I give you? What advice? What do you need? Where can I fit in? And, I, and hopefully I tried to do that. Um, it's not just the old joke about I'm from the RO and I'm here to help, you know. It's a bad feeling to, to, to really have something happen like threatening enterprise that when you started into the process you absolutely discounted that as a possibility. When it got there on that aspect, that south aspect with the wind on it, ran from here to here in about 45 minutes, two and a half, three miles. So it, it was very spectacular, you know, visible from anybody who was looking anywhere because that mountain's so high. Fine fuels, but it was, uh, you know, a lot of fire up on top and very visible. Uh, reaction from um, the folks in town, our incident command team was okay. This is this is heading towards town. You know, at that point, it got to a level where I was I was uncomfortable because I could see the I could see the goal, and as I think Gary described it, it, it was still quite a ways away, but it was there. And in the minds of those people, my credibility was taking a, a dive.
country, and we we I had been the agency rep on at least three of them, and then this one. Um, it was all suppression. You know, we were really dry. Things were burning. Um, however, you know, between Randy and I, we had been you know out here and talking to the the ranchers, and they were saying, "Let it burn, let it burn." Those kinds. Of, that's the message we were getting from them. Plus. This community that you just came through, Enterprise, is a, is a wonderful, wonderful community, a very supportive community in, uh, in multiple use management and, and understand the, the, the need to, uh, to change some of the vegetation out here. It was just getting overgrown and, and so forth. So uh, I, in my feeling was we had a lot of support here. Um, when Brett told me that we had an option to use fire use, that's all I heard. Um, I was I was really excited and when these guys called me and said we just got uh, two fires going in the Lost Peak area I'm I'm going you know and then Brett had said we have an opportunity to use fire use I I just was all all ears that's what I wanted to hear knowing this country and knowing what what we had between there and Enterprise and not any inholdings and no structures whatsoever except this little cabin you'll see you know I just couldn't see why we would do anything different than let it go. I'd like to add just one more thing while Bevan mentioned some of the cooperation with the local people. There's three grazing allotments involved, approximately 16 ranchers. And we had been on the phone basically with the lead guy from each of the allotments and they all concurred that they wanted to allow the, uh, make it a wildfire use and let it go. When we redid the NEPA for grazing permit issuance in 95, we did identify several burn projects, 1,000 to 1,500 acres in this country out west. So they were on board with us. When, they, when you approached these folks, you were thinking on a 1,500, 2,000 acre fire. What kind of reaction have you gotten out of 35,000? A year before, it had been in 2003, we had planned to do a burn in, in the Lost Peak and we had uh, written a, a letter and had concurrence from the six ranchers on the Bull Valley allotment in the heart by Lost Peak that we were looking at 1,500 or 2,000 acres. Since it got so large and it burned pretty near the entire heart out of the Bull Valley allotment, which is where we're going to keep the cattle off for two years, um, they don't like it, but they understand it will be a hardship on them for two years, but if they can get through this two-year period of complete grazing rest, they'll have one of the best ranges on the on the ranger district. Bevin called me at home and uh, uh, I was uh, reacting not a whole lot different from Bevin. The, uh, uh, the plan had been to do a prescribed burn out there. Uh, we call it the Greek Peak uh, Project. We tried to do it uh, four or five years earlier. Uh, had very limited success. So only got uh, uh, probably four to five hundred acres burned out of an eight hundred acre area. Uh, Division of Wildlife Resources had been on our case, uh, according to Doug Meverly, uh, who's our regional uh, manager up here in Cedar City for 20 years, uh, trying to get a vegetation uh, uh, manipulation project uh, out there for deer. If you'd, if you'd seen the uh, country, and maybe we'll see some pieces of it that didn't burn, the oak brush was so thick the deer couldn't even walk through it. It was that bad. BLM had no, uh, no other issues in terms of private land structures or anything else. This was a good area for us to take some fire. Uh, we went into the office the next day, made a lot of phone calls, and then the reality started to set in. Uh, and and it's, there's a couple issues here that are going to come up from time to time when you have a boundary between the two agencies. Uh, unfortunately, our planning uh, is never linked together like I think it ought to be, where we get it all done at the same time. That go, no go checklist, uh, as you heard everybody talk about that conversation on the phone that night, and I was at home, and I get a feeling from all the line officers after I give them the input of what I think the fire is going to do, the, the things at risk, try to describe those and get what they're thinking about uh, the event. Now did I describe how many acres, 35,000 potential? No. Didn't describe that, didn't think that was going to happen. I think we talked a little bit about the 7,000 acre within inside this mental MMA of, of roads. We talked about, you know, that's probably a really good realistic uh, uh, potential fire size. So hopefully we displayed those. All of those things go into the go-no-go no go decision. 
on that call that night and with all the line officers, making sure I'm telling them everything I know from the 15 years of doing fire in this area, from doing prescribed fire on that peak, you know, in 1998, what I saw, what I think the weather is going to do, and that full range of um, this is what I think the outside limit's going to be. And then I sit back and listen. And if I'm doing more talking than I, I doing listening, then I'm not doing my job. Once they get in that information and I hear Jim or Bob or Bevan or whoever asking questions and following a trail on, you know, how big is this going to be? And I hear their concerns. Those are the type of things I try to identify and expand on with what I know or what I think is going to happen. Um, that's, it seems like the only way to keep the information in the decision maker's mind is to help them with all the experience that you have on doing that. After spending time with Brett that night, I, I set up a public meeting uh, in Enterprise the next afternoon um, to start talking what we're doing, to give them some information about um, fire use. And, and it really paid off because uh, we started getting a few people. Uh, we had everywhere from 2 to 40, and we did it every night at the same time at the fire station. We even served hot dogs and hamburgers one night. Uh, and, but yet, it was very important for them people to know why we were going to do this. And it was amazing how much support we got. Um, later on in the fire, when it kind of started making a run, then you know it was a little different. But um, they, they were very supportive of it. And, and, uh, and to, to tell them what we were doing and how we had planned to burn there anyway, and, and we were trying to hold it in that area that he talked about, 7,000 acres, was very important that we talk to those people and let them know what we were doing all along the way. Now, myself speaking as a range con that's been on the district, I think, 16 years, uh, you got to get a feel for what the country or the landscape, ecosystem, what it needs. And from my perspective, the support that I had for implementing a wildland fire use program here was just pretty awesome. I had support from uh, the FMO Ox and, and the district ranger Bevan. Uh, from Brett Fay, Forest Supervisor, and on up. And, and that was very good to have that support to implement something that is going to be, is, it's going to work on the ground. It was something that needed to be done, and that support is really, really nice to have. We worked well together, even under some stressful situations, and, uh, and actually, in the long run, it turned out well. Because we were lucky last year to have a national Type 1 helicopter uh, crane in Cedar City, and we used it extensively. One of my ideas is the reservoir behind you that's nice and full right now uh, was not so full <laughs> last year, but it was still had, you know, lots of, you know, probably 30 acres worth of surface area of water in it. Our idea, the short turnaround to this area, you know, we're talking a half mile, three quarter of a mile, and 1,800 gallons on a Type 1 helicopter, you can slow down a fire pretty well for mitigation measures. Well, about midday on the 29th, after we got back on the ground, we thought about spooling up the helicopter and started working if we needed to to support this road. Uh, found out that um, there, the water in this reservoir was not available to us to be able to do that. That was like a, a hand grenade, I think is the term I used uh, uh, that day. And you know, I assumed what we did Early in the spring with this helicopter is identified areas through the state to make sure that they're available to use this water because drought conditions, water is very precious. So we did that early season. This was available. Well, something changed. Uh, the level went down. Um, so you know, we were informed we weren't able to use that, which changed our tactics quite a bit. With that air support, who knows how that would have changed things. And But um, that was one of the things in my mind that was going to be very effective to be able to support the hot shot crew or whatever tactics we're going to use on this road to hold it. First couple day day there when you you know you said 
how you had things covered out here with the operations people running operations and you were fire use manager but that time too we talked in the scenario there's a lot of ia going on and you had some other large fires of suppression and you were the fire use manager who was providing that other oversight as for duty officer for the suppression stuff were you trying to do that as your fire use manager also? Good question, Rod. Yeah, you know, there was a, a lot of stuff going on. Um, another thing that I mentioned on the way out is our fire center manager, who usually I really rely on for the big picture situational awareness when I, I need to be concentrated on something was out of the arena. We tried to order in uh, somebody to help and bolster that um, kind of shadow me to help with the uh, suppression fires and everything else. For this time period, we weren't actually able to get it until Patty showed up. Uh, well, we requested Patty to come down. And so with her coming down and uh, to give me a little more horsepower on the wildland fire use, I was able to back off on that, taking my full concentration and maintaining communication with the duty officers around the forest for suppression operations. I think it was about three or four days later, we did get somebody else in to help in the, the center manager to take that uh, floor officer, I think we called it, to look at the big picture with suppression, fire use, all the teams we had going on. So it, it was in our mind, we weren't, in my mind, it, we weren't, I didn't react to it as quickly as I should have. I should have had some people here to help us a little bit earlier than we did. of you who remember Dave Bunnell when he was uh, the Forest Service uh, fire, National Fire Use Specialist, he used to chide me on this all the time. He'd say, Thomas, you're wishing for a fire. And I always thought what he was doing with that was fighting my own group think. You know what I mean? And I'm not offering this as a critique, but, but, but I'm just wondering, do you guys have a team, a culture where if Jim or somebody said, hey, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with this stuff, that it can be surfaced? Uh, you know what I mean, in disgust. And I throw that out, not to put you on the spot, but just thinking of that HRO stuff because, you know, trying to get that discordant thought on the table so everything's on the table is a really hard maneuver in this business. So maybe just a comment on that. I listen to Brett when we have a fire. I listen to Brian. You know, I don't know fire like you guys do. Um, I do listen to my people and when you when you have people telling you that this country needs this or this country needs that, um, you, you have that in your mind, you think about it, you put it through your mind and, and develop how would you react to the communities when you when you get that situation and you know like I said we had been fighting fire all summer and everything was suppressed, suppressed, suppressed and, and then Brett found a window and and so I was you know ready fire aim but at the same time I I don't ever do I never push him into a corner I, I let him call the shots and then and then I put in the, what I want done and how we'd manage it and how we'd get something done with it and how we'd get benefits out of it it's it, that was what it was all about for me is the benefit of what we would get and and yeah, I if Jim would have said no, we can't we can't handle one right now, then then I might have backed off a little bit, but uh, there was no reason to with the setup that we had. Um, I'll just add from a maybe a, a little different level or different perspective. Our Color Country Fire Organization is set up. Um, so that it, and managed by um, a board of directors that includes me and Jim and, and the other uh, agency managers down here that are partners, including the state of Idaho. And I think we do have a very good mechanism, you know, to surface those kind of things and deal with them if, if in fact they come up. And I and I agree with uh, with Devin that if Jim would have said, you know, we just can't handle this right now, I, I think. You know, we, we, it probably would not have happened. I think if we had envisioned that this thing would be, um, 
you know, would be involving private lands and had talked to the state and they would have said, you know, we just don't think this is a good idea. I think we have a mechanism in place to, to deal with that. Once the fire did jump the road, the next question was, where's it going? And I just kind of, <laughs> I had to stop and pause a minute, and it was almost the flip of a coin. Uh, the General Steam Road progresses to the south, and uh, the next three miles south of here is where it did jump the road, and it got into a lot of this steep old nasty country here in what we call Racer Canyon. The prominent peak there on the skyline is Windy Peak. And of course, this flat top mountain here is, is called Flat Top Mountain, and that's the run it made on the, I guess, on the 30th and 31st. But it got down into all this steep, nasty volcanic tuff and rocky stuff, it was skunking around, it would heat up, we'd get some pretty good flames, and it would kind of die out, and, and uh, that was kind of where we made plans for the, I guess, the next day. It was still a a wildland fire use fire at the time it did across the road because we only had about three to four hundred acres across the road, if I remember right. And we really weren't guessing that it was going to come out of there like it did. I was in town telling them that we're stopping it at the road. <laughs> <laughs> and I appreciate Bob reminding me of that because that's what I was doing. At that point, I was not hearing really what was going on. So I was going on with the public in my meeting at 5 p.m., uh, we're stopping it at the road. It's going to be a, a place that where we can stop it. So that's what I was doing. And, and then it did jump what, while I was talking. And the fire had moved from the point of origin and when we were flying about noon in here. So it had moved a mile and a half pretty much to the east. Forecast was uh, no west winds. I mean, they had, we had two conflicting forecasts, but uh, one of them said the winds would be shifting to the south. So in my mind at that point after we got on the ground, okay, it's going to move this way until mid-afternoon, 1400, and then the south winds come down slope towards the reservoir and the campground. This is a, the point of concern, and we'd have time to prep over here in the afternoon, burn out in the evening to get that secured. Well, you can see this train, and every time I come out here, it amazes me of how confused the train in this country is on how, uh, you know, different aspects, uh, the wind channeling and et cetera does. But generally there's a ridge that runs east-west here uh, from the point of origin all the way over into this canyon. You know, it's pretty prominent, but it's fairly broken up. Typical fire behavior would tell you south aspects, you know, and the upslopes runs are the way it's going to go. For some reason, this fire decided to stay up on the spine of the ridge with the wind and travel all the way down towards this road, not go with any sort of southwest winds if they showed up and head towards this point of concern. Brett's kind of laid out our options. We, I know we had a conversation with you, Patty, on the phone, and, and we talked about a lot of those options and found out that, yes, indeed, we did have all those options um, under wildland fire use. Um, and, and so basically, uh, I was extremely uncomfortable with the direct uh, approach that had been suggested. And, and you can see why, looking down in there. It just, uh, uh, it was of significant concern to me to put people down in there. The other thing, as I recall, the smoke was such that we really couldn't get any kind of aircraft support for whatever we'd be doing. Uh, you know, we just wouldn't be able to operate down, down on that end of the fire at all. And so, um, you know, it was my decision not to do that and, and to, to go indirect, but to keep it in, in, in wildland fire use. Um, at, at that point, um, th though uh, I didn't really have to, you know, by protocol, you know, I, I started to think, you know, I really ought to talk to Jack a little bit about what's going on out here. <laughs> uh, you know, especially when, uh, when we're telling the people in Enterprise that we think we can hold this at the, at the, the General Steam Road, and then we are unable to hold it at the General Steam Road. And... Uh, uh, you know, we've, we've definitely moved into a, di a different situation. And so, um, so I, I gave Jack a call at home and, and we talked about, um, we talked about that and 
what was going on in the region and whether you know whether that was a reasonable risk uh, you know to take to keep it in wildland fire use and maybe Jack you want to take it from there right, but I can share with you a few key thoughts I had uh, the, the first one was uh, just just setting stage here a little bit we, I think we were prepared to level three nationally I just talking with Patty about that I know we weren't in four and five or this whole thing would have come to the region for approval for starters anyhow so I'm thinking uh, this is a, it seemed like the first time like three or four summers this late we were actually not in prepared to level four and five nationally which is a huge thing at my level that we have to think about in terms of available resources and what could happen and all you know all the pros and cons i am very supportive in hindsight and was at the time with the decision making process that went on with here the blm was involved and i was thinking even though we were in a long-term drought we were in preparedness level three all the things you you all talked about if we'd have made a no-go decision here in my mind that would tell me that we would almost always make a no-go decision around our region bob and i did have a conversation about well you know what what about bad outcomes and where you know where does this all go and we had the, the typical conversation because everyone in this in this agency and i assume it's in other agencies as well is worried about accountability and the risk and just the whole risk assessment thing with this this line of business so i remember talking to bob about two or three things one was uh if we're going to have a wildland fire use program it can never be zero risk if if we want to take the easy way out and always say no it's we can do that I mean, it's, I mean, probably uh, not resource-wise, but but politically, it'll, it's it's usually easier to take the you know, let it be a, a suppression action. We're always heroes when we're in a when we're a, when we're suppressing. We're less than heroes sometimes in 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 this phase. So so I just tried to reassure Bob that where I was personally is it's not a zero risk game, and that as long as we are comfortable, we're doing what we said we were going to do in terms of following our processes, I was very comfortable. Yeah, I just wanted to re-emphasize, um, Dave mentioned earlier about the group think and make sure you're touching all the things that you can think of that can go wrong. I think it was that day that Patty showed up and you know we went into another room that was fairly quiet and I said, Patty, this is what's going on. You know, give me your perspective on how we're managing things. And she shook her head and said, what the heck are you people? No, she <laughs> we, we, we talked a lot about options, uh, potential fire behavior, the, the next step in the, the fire progression, what was going on, unless we lose perspective of what was going on with Pine Park 2, how it related to this fire, how close they were and the wilderness fires over here and how to how to incorporate the, the big picture into that decision. But it's important to share that decision making, I think, at every point that you're making, or things don't go according to plan, as Jack says, you know, do you have a plan, is it a good plan? Well, we had a plan, we thought it was a good plan, but things changed. So the next challenge for us was to come up with another good plan for adapting to the, the new situation, and that's what we we're trying to do. talk about the 30th and that's when the wind started really coming. Uh, we had a uh, information person there who was telling me that people are calling and and saying that they can't breathe because of the smoke and just kind of really got me going. Um, so I knew I needed to get out here to Enterprise. But my phone rang and I, I stepped outside and this really happened. Um, a retired Forest Service employee um, Mac Thompson, who's down here, if you know Mac, he, you know, he's, he's just the biggest jokester in, in the world, but he wasn't joking, but I didn't know that. Um, he says, so, you know, there's no golf courses in Tonopah. <laughs> and I, I, says, I, I says, so? He says, uh, you, you know, you're almost ready to go to Tonopah. I says, no, guys, come on, Mac, what are you talking about? He says, I know rangers that got put in closets for what you're doing. <laughs> and finally I realized he's, he's, he's not kidding. And, um, and I think he was just doing it to, to, because he was my friend uh, to make me realize what I, what I was doing. And I guess he was resting that all on me. And 
And I was dumb enough to, to not even know the implications of that. But that happened, and then I decided I better get to Enterprise. If people are choking and they can't breathe and they can't, uh, I, I better get out there. And as I came, it, you know, the smoke was really laying down, and it was looking bad. And um, I remember coming into Enterprise, and there was a big red ball right there uh, above the fire station that looked kind of ugly. And at 5 o'clock, we had a meeting at the fire station. Um, we, that's what, it, it had jumped here and was making a run to across flat top. Um, and I said, we really believe that the wind's going to calm down any time now. One, la <laughs> one lady spoke up and said, who the hell are you, a tourist? <laughs> and, and I realized where I, where I stood right then. And, and so I, I, I had to come up with another tactic, I guess. And anyway, while I was talking and while we were discussing and talking about a lot of things, and the fire chief was there, believe me, he was right there with me all the time. Brett called and said, we're, we're uh, transitioning to a type 1 team. We're sending some heavies. So I got the phone. I said, you're going to see an air show now. And within 10 minutes, the first heavy came over town. And it was like I just gave them all candy. It, the, the, they just settled down. And it was just like uh, we get well. It, it was like I gave them a sleeping pill. It just calmed them down. And it really, uh, all the difference. So, Well, in the meantime, um, Gary's team was in place, the Type 3 team. We took a lot of Gary's resources to bolster the Type 3 team. We had, uh, I don't know how many engines out there, and, uh, you know, three hotshot crews. We were doing a lot of, you know, get ready to burn out to protect the, the, the town. So this between 1630 when it headed up here and across the top was a very uh, busy time uh, during the fire transition and made a lot of set up a lot of the decisions subsequent that evening on what happened here, how visible it was there, and was it meeting our objectives, and how far out of the, the second good plan on this fire that we had to hold it here and ready to burn this out. Now we're into trying to develop our third good plan and following it on this fire. And again, the, the time frame from here, 28th of the evening, to the evening of the 30th, you know, we're talking two burn days and about 10 or 12 miles of, of fire travel. Everybody was busy. Uh, I was listening to voices. Everybody was doing their job. They weren't straying back and forth. Um, you know, it was an exciting time though. And at this point, and this a little bit personal, but I grabbed Bob out in the hallway. And, you know, me telling him that, you know, this is a good fire. You know, the evening of the 28th, signing the paper on the 29th, Bob, it's going to be good. No problem. And then converting it to a suppression event, it's the last thing you want to tell your line officer. So uh, you're thinking of ways of why shouldn't we do this? Why should we keep it in wildland fire use? But all the indicators were telling you that this is not a good fire anymore. That's the most difficult decision you're ever going to make is that now we've got to change to a suppression mode. But, and I, I, there you go again, back to my thing, the appropriate management response is what you went to, and I think that's what you have to look at it. I don't think it was a bad fire yet. That's my yeah, you're right, not a bad fire, but in our community, when you, you plan on doing one thing, here's the third plan that didn't go as planned, and we're going into actually a fourth plan now and trying to make that successful. So if you're looking at it from that perspective, our plans have not worked three successive times, and we're into our fourth one. You know, it is, I think, conceivable if we would have made, and we did talk about this, made the call to keep this in wildland fire use, uh, we probably from a resource standpoint and even from the standpoint of the town of enterprise could have survived that decision um, well. The, the thing I, could, I think we could not have survived was the public perception that we were still managing that thing as a wildland use fire while we were preparing and or burning out on private property even though, strictly speaking, our fire was not on private property. We, we were still within that MMA at that point. The question was, did our burnout, I guess, along this Shoal Creek Road and down toward Cass Springs and up toward Pilot Peak, did the fire actually hit our burnout operation? 
the burnout operation on this division, no, the fire never did progress that way. It was wind driven this way. From this point south and all the way down to here, the fire hit our burnout. It hit the line hard. Okay. So that was essential to, to controlling the fire from moving towards Enterprise then? Yes, sir, it was. Thank you. I don't care how it looks for Region 4 or, or me on this. What counts is that we follow uh, you, you know, our, our, our thought progression, and when it's time, it's time. And one of the criteria should not be, well, how does it make the region look? <laughs> so I just wanted to make that point. So I think I said, yeah, Bob, sounds like it was time to do that. Don't worry about it. Second point I wanted to make is going back, and, and, and when I get briefed on these things, uh, going back, remember this is preparedness level three, when things don't go according to plan, as they don't sometime, we had access to resources. And clear back from the very first beginning of this, one of the reasons I told you I wasn't too stressed out was, you know, if things change, we can get resources and, and adapt as things change. And they did happen. And so I think that's a key point. If this had been prepared as level five nationally and there weren't resources to help us, I mean, whole different deal. The worry and stress level is going to get higher. And the third point I wanted to make is just standing here watching this, it strikes me, and I think Bob mentioned this to me that night, some tremendously skillful work went on that day to do that burning out. And it worked. And all that happened before that Type 1 team got here. And so I think that is a, that's a true compliment to the people on the ground, the, to uh, uh, Gary Cohn's team, who was part of all that, that we need to remember. I did want to spend a few minutes, though, on that decision to go suppression and just give my observations. We had conversations all day long once I got here, and I know there had been a lot going on the previous day. And I think anyone would say the same thing. There's little red flags, you know, it goes sideways, it goes sideways, it goes sideways. When, when is enough enough? And it's not a black and white answer, and that's why I think we had so many discussions with our partners, with the locals, every, everyone involved. So there's just, you know, there's just a lot of feelings and you try to pick up on things. And one thing I don't, I don't know if it can come out in a setting like this is some of the emotions. So I think you have to try to explain where, what you're feeling. And I was really trying to pick up on how people were feeling, not just whether we're following policy and, you know, the letter of the MMA line and all of those things. And, and all those little things started adding up to me, like the BLM, you know, it was starting to move south that day and they had a limitation on how many acres really met their plan and there was a little bit of not certain if, if that really fit in quite right. I, I could tell, at least from my perspective, it felt like they would be more comfortable if we went to a confined contained strategy. Of course, that meant by policy, because we can't do more than one strategy on a fire, that we would have to stop doing wildland fire use on our side. So we had that discussion several times during the day. Um, and I know a lot of us, or at least some of us, have had discussions and we know and feel and understand that we can do anything on a wildland fire use event that we do on a suppression event. But I don't know that everybody's there and I don't know that our public is there. But to look at it now, I, you can, I think you can argue, hey, we could have hung on to that. Look, it didn't, there was just that one little piece of burnout, you know. But, but you have to understand where you were at the time. And at the time, it felt like we'd pushed it enough. We'd pushed it, we'd had discussion um, decision points about three times that day, plus one the previous day. And it just felt like we're probably there. And if, and if we go any farther, if that fire decides to take off towards Enterprise or do anything unexpected the next day, we'll kind of go back and I worried about us losing credibility with our public and with our partners and, and finally knowing when to say when. And so I felt good about uh, where we came to that decision. And you can, in hindsight, I think you can, you can make lots of discussions either way. But um, my feeling at the time when we finally said, yeah, let's throw in the towel, I felt like there was a collective sigh that went off in the room. And, and, and I could be imagining things, but I felt like there was just kind of a sigh and almost a, well, it's about time they came to their senses. You know, thank God. <laughs> so. You know, whether that's accurate, I, I got to think there was at least a little of that, or I don't know that I would have picked that up. But, um, I, you know, we're all going to be in different places. And my, 
where I was coming from is I don't know that it's failure to go from wildland fire use to suppression as much as it's is it would be failure to have something bad happen because you dig your heels in and and worry about what you call it. I'll never forget the, the evening that it actually come around the end of Flat Top between Flat Top and Pilot Peak. Um, I was with Bill Murphy at the time, the county fire warden, and as it come around the corner, he looked at me and said, Jeff, this is your fire, what do you want? I've only been a fire chief for two years, I've been on the fire department for a lot of years, but we need to understand that we hadn't been faced with anything like the Hawkins fire before. When that fire came roaring around the end of Flat Top, um, in our perspective, it was headed right for Enterprise. But as it turned out, we started calling in some resources. Actually, Bill started calling in some resources, and um, I started to feel quite a bit of relief right then. Um, I knew that I still had a lot of responsibility there. We still had a lot of worry about um, possible evacuations as time went on. And I think Randy was probably even talking about this a little bit. This area right here that we're in right here, we come up here to do some evacuations. We made the decision that we need to do some evacuations up here, number one with the fire pushing this way with the pre prevailing winds, but also they were going to do that burnout right along the back of me right here. And some people were really, really good about it. Um, didn't have a minute's hesitation. Other people really gave us some flack. Um, did not want to leave. Matter of fact, told us straight out that they were not going to leave. And so we had to move on to the next one. Um, but I can tell you that since that happened, I have seen some of the people living on the outskirts of town doing some mitigation of their own. They're starting to ladder up the trees and, and clearing out some of the trees. Um, a lot of good has come from that. When the Hawkins fire was first reported to me, and I was informed that it was going to be tantalized as a fire use fire, my first question was, didn't two or three weeks beforehand we spend an awful lot of money just south of there to make sure it didn't get up on here? So I thought, well, I have to trust my partners and let them do what they want. And they said it was 40 to 100 acres, something on that magnitude. And I, I can't really honestly think that I ever got any additional updates. I'm sure I must have, but they didn't register with me. One of the things that would be real handy is to be able to talk to uh, the folks on this end, but having been in that position more times than I care to remember, my chances of getting a hold of Brett and having any kind of conversation with him at that point in time would have been almost minimal because he was, he was extremely busy at that point in time. And I guess it goes down to lack of communication. I really appreciate having had the opportunity to come here and hear the blow by blow events of what happened here because there was a lot of missing pieces. I have a lot of trust of, of the folks down here, but when you don't have those pieces to fill in the gap, sometimes you can create your own fiction. And unfortunately, that fiction sometimes, what the heck are those dummies doing? And that's not, not my intent to do that, but uh, it helps to understand what the events occurred. And I, it's one of the reasons I appreciate this. With respect to this fire, I, I think that uh, we had a chance to use a tool. We made a good decision to use it. And, and as I've said before, I think that uh, good people did the right thing here, step by step. We didn't end up with the outcome that we had planned, but I'm very comfortable with how people handled themselves in this process. The most important part of this whole two days that we've been, uh, been doing this, and that's the integration phase where we, uh, we try to bring uh, a coherent view to everything that you've been reading and you've been thinking about and uh, the talks that you had last night, um, what you were thinking about this morning, the, all the questions that are still unanswered and, and you know, how you can bring this all together. And I, I wanna encourage you to be candid and open and honest. Um, we owe a great deal of thanks to, uh, to the Dixie for opening up their books and, uh, and showing us you know, where they made mistakes, where they did things right, uh, things that they may not be proud of and, and things that they are proud of. And uh, you know, I think it's incredibly admirable that, uh, that Bob Russell and, and Brett Frey in particular, and Bevan as, as well, to, to just be so open and honest. And that's how we need to conclude this, is really be candid, uh, you know, be respectful. I'm not saying, you know, be disrespectful in any way. Be respectful, but open and candid. The first thing that really uh, struck me about this trip was the commitment from the four supervisor down to the local level. Um, I come from the BT, you know, everybody says we have a pretty good program, but we're still struggling to convince some of the line officers that 
that they really want to have fire used. And, and what happens there is when you have something like that is, is that when things start to go wrong, it turns into a panic and then it's always the fire people or somebody else that wanted to have the fire. Th it's much easier to deal with things when they go wrong if you have support. Um, it makes a huge difference. One thing that I did notice at each of the stands was how adaptive this organization was to what was occurring. Filling in positions with maybe not the most um, normal uh, use of the uh, fire use team, putting them where they were needed, merging them in with the type one organization. So they were willing to adapt based on the situation that was out there, which I think is not unique in the Forest Service. But it's, it's really great to see, and it happens quite a bit in fire. One thing I... I that's changed for me a little bit, my perspective, and I've been involved with fire use for quite a few years now, and I sensed it a little bit here, is that uh, there tends to be a stigma or that we feel like we've failed if in fact we've made the conversion to a suppression fire. And one thing that's, that I'm changing my view a bit is that it's just, and looking at it as just a continuum in the process of decisions, and that there really was no failure and I, I hope that our culture changes a little bit so that managers like myself can support fire people that, that it's not a bad thing. Um, I, I'm a little bit concerned if that stigma continues that the need to convert will have to be made and it won't be and then we'll get somebody hurt or ben, burn up some, some structures. I didn't consider the fire a problem at all. I mean, you were what's Dave talk about being resilient every time something went wrong and you had a curveball thrown at you you dealt with it and and what the other thing I saw is even after you decide to go to type 1 team you know sometimes the tendency is to just pull back and give up and you didn't I mean the the stuff that you did that last day with a burnout basically you finally dealt with the fire and it's easy to give up it's easy after two or three failures to give up and uh, and, and just say well we'll let the team deal with it and you didn't, and that's, that's huge. But the fact that you looked at this fire and you went forward with it, you know, that's okay. Maybe you were a little bit outside of where your comfort level was, but now when you have other fires, you'll have sort of a benchmark. You know, we talked about bringing a team in, and the nice thing about bringing a team is you do have somebody, you have some people that are maybe a little more dispassionate that look at things from a fire behavior standpoint. I know Patty came down and that really helps. And I guess the only thing to, you know, maybe that you would have thought about is, I don't know if you had somebody look at the fire, not as a fire use manager, but just as a fire behavior person that wasn't involved in the direct management that said, you know, have you thought about this or thought about that? And that really helps. I think, you know, Patty probably did that when you came down, but sometimes I don't want to say you fall in love with the fire, but sometimes you get going on it as the manager and, and sometimes you need somebody to come in and just say, did you look over here, or what if something like this happens? And that's big. event just from you guys coming and finding out that there's a lot more to you know the importance of planning importance of doing the right thing and, and making things happen that we want to make happen to benefit the, the resource we're very busy on this ranger district with uh, very few people and and yeah it was good for us to come and, and let you experience what we we had last year I've learned from just your comments, how important it is to do the right thing. And I think we need to stop and reflect and say, what did we do right? And how, what ha would happen if it would have went wrong? And so, you know, this will help me prepare for the next time and, and give me uh, another 
layer of comfort zone out there that I can depend on because I've been there. So I really appreciate you having this. And again, the, my first reaction was, oh, not us. But I appreciate that I, I got to be involved in this. So thanks. I really believe what Bob and Brett and Bevan and the whole crew down here have done in the last uh, couple of days, but before that, is they're, they're, they exemplify what an HRO, a high reliability organization, looks like. I mean, if White and Sutcliffe were here, they would applaud. You guys have opened up your whole decision process to a group of people. We had no idea, you had no idea how it was going to turn out, what people were going to think. And, and I just want to say to Bob and you guys, this is not common. Uh, in fact, it's been my experience working with these, quote, near misses, Jim, you'd call them wake up calls, that our tendency is, my tendency too is, hey, we made it through, we lucked out, let's sweep it kind of under the rug. You know, we don't have to deal with it. Hell, everything worked out in the end. And, and, and what we have done by doing that is we, we, we're, we're not learning. We're not, tr we're not as, a, as a team, as a culture, trying to pick up on the weak signals. So, I, I mean, what you guys are doing in, in the model you're displaying for not only us, but the rest of the region is just outstanding. Something else I, I thought might would be appropriate for, for this crowd right here is to let you know what's happened since the Hawk and Spire. Um, a, a part of my crew got to work right along this road here that night when they were doing the burnout. These were fresh wildland firefighters, had just got their red cards maybe a year prior to that. Um, they learned a lot that night about fire and about fire suppression and what it can do. And we've had people spurred on and wanting to get further education simply because of what's happened right here on this fire. But I can tell you that that's one of the, the things that's happened from this fire that has, in my mind's eye, made the community a better community. Um, we're, we're getting better training. We know now what it's gonna take if a, uh, a situation like this happens again. And I think we'll be better prepared for that. I, I myself personally believe that 10 years from now, a lot of the details about how this happened won't be as important as what it actually looks like on the ground. And I'm not nearly as good as, say, guys like Randy or, or Brian, who are veg experts here. But from what I saw this morning, I'm optimistic that 10 years from now, these thousands of acres are going to be some of the best looking acres around here. The allotments are going to be some of the best allotments. And that's what's going to sell the, bringing back fire into, into its proper role.